but today uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 40 through 45. So go ahead and open up your Bibles there. We're going we're gonna to talk about uh, a leper that Jesus encounters in, uh, in Mark 1, which is also, it coincides with uh, Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 5 in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, so with that being said, we're going to stand for the reading of God's word, and then we're going to get into it. So would you stand, please? Verse 40, Mark chapter 1. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said this, I am willing. Be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned the leper and sent him away at once and said, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him uh, from every direction. You may be seated. So maybe you're wondering, you know, what does leprosy have to do with loneliness? Like, you made me say leprosy to my, my neighbors. What does it have to do with loneliness? Like, this story, uh, this, this account is just Jesus healing another person. Like, it, it happens all the time, right? Like, no big deal. Jesus just touches someone and they're healed. Like, this guy had leprosy. Like, you know, he's had scabs all over his skin. No big deal. What does that have to do with loneliness? Anyone, anyone there right now? Anyone like, hey, what does this have to do with, with, with loneliness? Anybody? Yeah? couple of people. Some of you just know exactly what's going to happen. So uh, I guess there's no surprise there. But in order to understand what's going on here, uh, we have to turn to the Old Testament. Because you need to remember Jesus was a Jew, right? And so in the time he operated for a century, Judaism was uh, the, the law, you know, all that is what was followed. And so we have to understand, like, the, the context of Judaism in order to understand why some of these things are so important. So we're going to flip back uh, to Leviticus um, chapters 13 and 14. So go ahead and flip there. Now, we're not going to read through it all. We're really not going to read through much of it. But I just want you to familiarize yourself with where we're at. And I want to challenge you. You know, when you leave, or maybe even during Feed the Community, you sit and you read and, and you try to understand all the things that happened um, with, with leprosy, okay? So we're, we're going we're gonna to park there for a moment, and we're, we're going to get to that. But what I want all of you to do right now is just imagine with me, okay? Can we all use our imaginations? I know some of us are a little tired or a little hungry, but let's put, put the mental power towards it. I want you to put yourself in 400 BC, 400 years before Christ is on the scene, and you are a Jew, okay? So you operate within uh, the Mosaic law. Like, this is what you follow, right? So you are a Jew in 400 BC. Uh, Pastor Jeff is in 400 BC, and in fact, he is actually Priest Jeff, uh, or Chef, as they might say um, in the Hebrew language. So... Pastor Chef um, is, I don't actually know if that's the Hebrew word for, for Jeff, but it is now. I just made that. Anyway, so he's a priest. He has a, he has a wonderful and beautiful family. He has two really crazy kids and one absolute peanut uh, of, of a baby. And he has a wife who sort of helps out uh, doing some stuff uh, within the temple. I don't know, okay? I don't know if women were allowed to do what she does in, in, the, in the temple, but... She runs the Temple Kids Ministry, okay? So, so Pastor Jeff is there, so that, that'll help you imagine. So just take what you have now, and I want you to just, like, put it back 400 B.C. Dell runs the, the worship team uh, in, in, in uh, a synagogue outside of the main, uh, main Jerusalem, and so he's there. He's got, he's got a family. Um, and so you have a family. Uh, Leah has a family in 400 B.C., okay? And it's, it's this beautiful thing, right? So just imagine yourself in 400 B.C., okay, and you just slept really well last night, and you wake up, and on your arm, 
you notice a little spot, a little bump. It's kind of a white head on it. Today, you might think, oh, it's probably just an ingrown hair. You're going to squeeze it, you know, watch the juice shoot out, put some Neospore on it, slap a Band-Aid on there. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Who else wouldn't do that? Like, but in 400 B.C., things are a little different. See, Pastor Jeff, being a priest, knows exactly what's up. And so do all of you, because you have read the law. Most boys, uh, by the age they were 15, had the first five books of the law memorized. So they knew what was in Leviticus 13 and Leviticus 14. Pastor Jeff knew that spot wasn't just any ordinary spot. He knew what he needed to, to do next. He had to go to one of his colleagues and present himself before another priest. And so would each and every one of you. And when you present yourself, the priest is going to examine. He's going to look at the hair follicle. He's going to look at the, the wound itself, the sore itself. And then he's going to decide whether it looks like it could be leprosy or whether it's just a normal ingrown hair. And to do that, he's going to put you in a house isolated from everybody for seven days. No phones, no connection with your family, no human interaction, just you in an isolated place. Does that sound familiar? Like regardless of what you think politically about you know, what the COVID pandemic is or was, when it first hit, right, all of us were freaking out. I was, free, I was, in, I was in college and I was freaking out. I didn't know what was going on, right? And so what do we do? We just like locked ourselves in our rooms like for 14 days and we were like, hold up. I can't be in contact with anybody. People are dying from this. Like, China's going nuts. Like, what's going on? Live streams getting blocked in China now that I said that. But, um, like, nobody knew what was going on. And so you can kind of relate to this a little bit, you know, real time. But, like, let, let's step back to 400 B.C. Now, after the seven days, you know, you're anxiously awaiting the wound on your arm to go away, but nothing's happened. It's not going away. It's, it's not spreading and so the priest comes and he inspects it and he says, hasn't gone down, hasn't spread. Got to keep you here for another seven days. So you, who have a family and a life and a job, Pastor Jeff, who is a priest in the temple, cannot go and worship. He can't be around his family. He can't be around his kids. He can't snuggle his baby Zeke. He is stuck in this house, isolated. You are stuck in this house, isolated. You can't do anything. You're, you're stuck. And after those 14 days, you better be praying that that spot doesn't spread. Because if it is spread in the slightest, when the priest comes in after those other seven days, he's going to take a look at it. And he's going to say, yep, that's leprous. You have leprosy. Immediately, you would be marked as unclean and you would be sent out of the camp, out of the city. You would have to shout everywhere you go, I'm unclean, don't touch me. I'm unclean, don't touch me. You couldn't go into a store and buy something uh, because if you touched it, that object would be unclean and then if someone else touched it, they would be unclean. So you could have no physical interaction with anyone you loved or else they would also become unclean. Now, most people are like, well, just like wash your hands or something, right? That's not what it means. Unclean, in this sense, meant not fit for worship. And because the Jews, like that was their whole premise, like worship of God in the temple, if they were unclean, they could not go. So Pastor Jeff, the priest, could no longer go into the temple. He could no longer be an instrument of worship. Dell could no longer lead worship. Uh, Royce could no longer lead worship. Luke could no longer counsel people. It was over. Your life was gone. Your family, you were isolated from them. Your friends didn't talk to you. Your job, done. You felt completely and utterly alone. You guys kind of understand where, where we're headed with this? Now, let's, let's bring it back to today. We don't really have that. 
right? Jesus made us clean. He said, I've made all unclean things clean. So we don't have that today. But what do we have? Well, we have stay-at-home moms. We have stay-at-home moms who work all day trying to take care of some kids that are screaming and running their heads around. They're ripping off their dirty diapers and flinging them around like they're at a rodeo or something. There's poop on the walls. Like, food isn't getting cooked. Dishes aren't getting clean. Laundry isn't getting washed. And, and, and you're, like, stuck here, and you're like, man, like, when is this going to end? Like, can they be 18 already? Like, get them out of my house. Uh, I, I'm, I'm losing my mind. I feel like I have no help. And then your husband comes home. He's been working all day. He walks in. He sits on the couch, and he's like, He's like, woman, where's my dinner? And then it feels like, it feels like he doesn't appreciate what you've done. He doesn't appreciate that you've been slaving away all day trying to take care of the family and and take care of the house and you feel completely and utterly alone in your own marriage with someone who you share uh, things emotionally and, and share intimacy with. You feel completely alone. Let's, let's flip it around. Maybe, maybe you're the, the working father, and, and you're, you're busting your tail all day, and, and you're, you're working this factory job. It's hot. It's sweaty. It stinks. All the machines are breaking down. Your boss is on your tail. Your coworkers are nagging you, and, and you come home, and, and all you want, you want some food, you want something to drink, and you want to talk with your wife about how crappy your day was. But, but she, she's in the kitchen, and she just looks at you with this mad look on her face. And, 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 like, and like you want to be appreciated for what's going on, and you have this expectation that, that you know, there are things, emotions are going to be exchanged, and there's going to be conversation. And then she's like mad at you, and like you barely saw her today, and like you didn't really do anything. And you feel alone even when she's right next to you. You feel alone in your marriage. But perhaps, perhaps you're not even there. Maybe you're a single guy or a single, single girl. And, and like you're, you're doing this whole life thing. You're doing this whole life thing and, and you're lonely. Like you, just, you, just want a, you just want a boyfriend or you just want a girlfriend or you just want to be married. You want to share uh, things with them. And you just feel completely alone. Perhaps. Perhaps it's none of those. Perhaps instead, you're sitting in this very room, surrounded by a hundred other people, and you feel completely isolated. Not just from them, but you feel isolated from God. When Royce asked us to stand up and sing the songs, that's what they were. They were just songs, words on a screen, nothing more. You just didn't connect. You felt like God wasn't with you. You feel alone in your struggle. You feel lonely. Maybe you're there. Now, I wanted to do this little experiment, this little exercise, to get you to feel your loneliness, to get you to feel the isolation. Because if we don't feel it, we can't come to terms with it, we can't deal with it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pray, because I've been sort of rambling on. We haven't prayed yet. And then we're going to, we're going to talk about some of the statistics of loneliness in America today. And like, like parents, parents, like parents, look at me. I, w- I want you to listen up. If you have kids who are teenagers, this is super important. One of the statistics, I'm going to jump into it, 71% of Gen Z, which is teenage kids, and millennials, which is probably a lot of other people in this room, feel, 71% of them feel alone and lonely. That's 71 people out of 100. 71 people in this room feel alone, even with so many people around them that love them. So it's imperative that we talk about this today. So with all that being said, why uh, why don't we pray and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for your word and, and, and Lord, just the, the guidance that it provides for us. Uh, Lord, that we can go into it, we can meditate on it, we can read it, we can pray over it. Uh, Lord, and there's comfort that's provided. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, today uh, your words would just ring clear in our minds and our hearts. Uh, Father, I pray that 
that you would guide me in the speech uh, of, of my mouth, uh, Lord, that all the things that, that come from it are of you and not of my own self. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, our, our church would be edified and strengthened. Uh, Lord, be with us this, this hour or so, uh, and Lord, uh, receive uh, all glory and honor. Um, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we need to define some, some terms of loneliness. Are you guys, are you guys doing okay? Like, I, I, brought it, I brought it way down, okay? I brought it way down. Some of you are sleeping, okay? So we're going we're gonna to bring it back up a little bit here. We're going to have some fun. You guys ready to worship through the preaching of God's word? Doesn't sound like it. You guys ready to worship through preaching? Yeah. Let's go. That's more like it. See, I, I don't do that because I need the assurance. I do that because it helps you guys wake up a little bit. Some people. Some people are fine. They're, they're engaged. But some people just need a little extra boost. Red Bull will do the trick too. Anyway, defining loneliness. So there are many different forms of loneliness. We talked about the different forms just a second ago in those examples. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to define three types uh, that most uh, psychologists will refer to. Uh, the, the first one is emotional loneliness. Uh, this is the one that um, most single people will feel and most married people will also feel. It's, uh, it's the lack of emotional connection or physical intimacy with someone else. Okay, so the lack of emotional connection or physical intimacy with some, someone else. This is felt by people who are single, and this is also felt by people who are married. Single because you have the lack of that, because it's absent in your life. Married because there's a problem between you and your spouse that's causing a division. Okay, so, so those, that's the first type, emotional. This is what most young people feel. Uh, most young people feel uh, emotionally lonely. Uh, the second type is social loneliness. Now, social loneliness is the, is the type of loneliness that we feel when there's a lack of a social group or friend group. Okay, so, so your social network is, is minimal, your friend group is minimal. This kind of loneliness is what the elderly generally feel. Uh, you know, they, they have their family, but they feel, you know, all their friends are dying and like, you know, the, all this stuff, and, and, and so they feel socially alone. They feel like they don't have the network or the community that they used to have. And then the final version of loneliness, uh, this is generally referred to as existential loneliness um, or uh, dealing with, like, the human condition loneliness. Um, most secular uh, researchers will, will, will say this because it deals with impending doom, death, life, and, and the purpose of life, and you feel lonely in that, or you feel some sort of struggle. Um, in reality, what this is, is spiritual loneliness. Spiritual loneliness is the feeling of distance from God, which is what all of that sort of forms into is a distance. You feel impending doom. You feel like life has no purpose. It's because there's a distance from you uh, and God, okay? So we've defined these three things, and we're going to talk about each one of them a little bit uh, throughout this uh, little time. And again, the reason why I want to bring up statistics is because this is what's happening today in our society. Like in our community, in Yankton, in South Dakota, in the Midwest, in the U.S. Like it's happening here. It's good to know this information so you know, number one, that you're not alone in your struggle with loneliness, and number two, you know how to best minister to somebody. So we've defined the three types. Uh, what I want to do now is, is share some statistics. Um, so what's interesting in that is that social isolation and loneliness have incredible health risks. Do you guys know that? Some, some people suggest that being lonely is worse for your health than smoking one to two packs of cigarettes a day. It's worse than that, which is nuts. Like, lonely, you're just lonely. You're not, like, inhaling something. It's just you're lonely, and it causes serious problems. Um, here's, here's a few uh, really, really interesting statistics. Isolation, social, social isolation and loneliness, increased health risks or the, or the risk of premature death from all causes. Literally anything, if you were lonely, the risk was higher that you would die from it. Common cold, higher. Flu, higher. Car crash, higher. Like all deaths of every single type, it was higher if you were lonely. Social isolation and loneliness was also associated with a 50% increase in dementia among elderly people. Now, 
Some people don't know this, but I worked as a CNA in, uh, in the nursing home when I was in high school uh, through about halfway through college. And so I saw elderly people constantly. I saw the loneliness that they felt in, in the nursing home when family wouldn't or couldn't visit. I saw the loneliness they felt. And almost every single time when someone didn't have a visitor or didn't have a guest, that resident most likely had signs of dementia or Alzheimer's. Now, that, that isn't the case for all of them, but most of them, that was the case. And sometimes the only intimacy they got, the only emotional connection or social connection they got was when a staff member was changing their brief, was changing their diaper, when a staff member was putting them to bed. Now, that's, that's not good. It's sad, and it, and it breaks my heart to see that. Loneliness is, is causing so many problems in America. So many problems in our own community. It's, it, it's, it's raging among uh, Gen Z and millennials. 71% of Gen Z and millennials struggle with loneliness. Uh, on, on average, loneliness increases rates of um, depression, anxiety, and suicidal uh, ideations by like 10% uh, among all three. So it's a really, really, really big problem. It also showed that 50% of baby boomers, so those are the, old, the older folks. I'm not saying that as a joke. 50% of the baby boomers, that generation, struggle with loneliness. So it's not just a young person problem. It is an eclectic problem that we all face. Gen Z and millennials are the loneliest generation. So here are some of the causes, some research that was done here. 53% of people say that they are too shy or introverted to make friends. 27% say that they don't really feel like they need friends. 26% say that their hobbies or interests don't facilitate friendships. 20% say that friendships are too much work. 14 say that they are too busy for friendships, and 11% say they recently moved and had trouble finding new friends. So among this population, a large majority of people think that it's easier to deal with their loneliness on their own and just struggle with it than it is to go out, find community, and make friends. What's interesting about this statistic, now th this is what's going to blow your mind, okay? This means... That as a society, we are more likely to share ourselves physically, we are more likely to share our bodies than we are to share our emotions or thoughts and feelings with other people. Isn't that crazy? We're more likely to share our physical bodies as a society than to share what's going on inside here or in here. Because we feel so alone and because of all these other issues. That's a huge, huge, huge problem. Huge problem. Among the youth, that, that means, okay, there, there are about 1,000 students in Yankton High School and Middle School, okay, and I minister to them. 710 of them deal with this. 710 of them, which is a huge amount, deal with anxiety and depression and loneliness. A study from 2006 now, even though it's old research, it's still good research. A study from 2006 is a longitudinal study from 1980 to 2006. In 1980, they found that the average person had three close friendships that they could share uh, their, their thoughts and their emotions with. They had three people. In 2006, that number had decreased from three to two, which is crazy big, uh, you know, just considering the time and, and a large group. With that, 24% of people, that's one of every four people, which means that there are 20 people in here who think that they have zero friends, that they have nobody they can connect with, nobody. So it's important to think about these. And then we add in the data about smartphones and social media that launched after that study. That number, the 24%, 
has increased considerably. No research has been done on it, but you can assume uh, from the, the onset of social media, the, the interconnectedness. Like, how many of you have TikTok on your phones? Let me see some hands. We're a participatory church. How many of you have Instagram? Facebook? There we go. LinkedIn? A couple of people. All right. We won't talk about that. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter, right? So how easy is it for us to sit on our phones all day instead of connecting with other people? So easy. We can sit and we can scroll through TikTok on our day off and just lay in bed or scroll through Instagram or scroll through Facebook. Even though, even though that social media allows us to be connected with people far away, it still creates a considerable distance because all you're doing is looking at the best of people's lives. You're looking at the best points. They're, they're on vacation. Oh, they're always on vacation. No, they're not. They're just posting the same pictures from the one vacation. And so you see that constantly, and you're like, my life sucks. I feel so alone. They have so many friends. But people are posting the best things about themselves, and it's making us feel even more lonely. I want to share with you a story. I've shared this before. Um, when I was in high school and when I was in college, uh, my main goal was to get a girlfriend and finally not be lonely. Okay, that was it. Right? I was like, that's going to solve all of my problems. All of my problems are going to solve when I either get married or you know, get a girlfriend, whatever. I won't be lonely anymore. I won't be depressed. I won't feel anxious. I won't have any of it. And so, you know, as a stupid young dude, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go out to these parties because that's where, you know, all the movies, that's where dudes pick up chicks, right? And I'm not saying chicks in a derogatory way. I'm just explaining my thought process, you know, when I was 18, 19, 20. Um, and so, you know, I would go out to parties and be like, I'm going to go pick up some chicks. And you know, it wouldn't work. I'd just feel more lonely. I'd go out drinking and, uh, you know, be smoking weed and, and all this stuff, like just partying it up and try, trying to find someone that's going to fix my problems when we all know that someone else isn't going to fix it, right? It's not going to be some, some girl you pick up at a bar or some dude you pick up at a bar. It's not going to be that. And so I felt considerably more and more lonely, and so my addiction to pornography grew because I thought that would fix the problem. I thought that looking at two-dimensional images online would fix my problem of loneliness. I thought that it would, it would make me feel good, that it would take away some of the pain. But it just created more and more problems to the point where alcohol was something I consumed daily and it, became, it came to the point where I consumed marijuana every day, multiple times a day in any form I could get it, just to numb what was going on. And so one day I was just feeling really down, needed someone to talk to. So I called up a friend and I said, hey, I, I need to hang out. I need to talk to you. So I drove to Mitchell to meet them. And then nothing. There was no response from them, no text, no call. They had said that they had fallen asleep. I don't think they did. <laughs> and so I felt so incredibly alone because the things I was putting in my body to try and cope with it pushed me away from community more and more until I was isolated and by myself. And so in that moment, I decided I was going to take my own life. I remember it very clearly. It was a very foggy night. And I was going to drive my car into the next overpass on the interstate. I'm just going to end it like that. And then in a moment, sobriety hit. In a moment, the Lord sobered me up and showed me that I wasn't alone. He showed me I wasn't alone in this world. And that night, that night, I began to seek after him. A couple of weeks later, I contact Pastor Jeff. I apologize for abandoning him a couple of years prior, prior to that. And here I am. The Lord has radically changed. The Lord has radically changed my life. I went from a lonely kid to someone who's talking about this struggle that we all face. And it's not anything that I did. Nothing that I did. But all that he did. 
So I want to give you some comforts. I want to give you some comforts for your loneliness. And, and, and maybe, like real quick, maybe you don't feel lonely. And like this sermon just isn't hitting. Like you're like, I'm not lonely. I got great friends. I got great family. Like my squad and I, we, we wrap it up. Like maybe you're there. That's okay. It's okay to not be lonely. It's okay not to struggle with some of the things that we've talked about. But I still want you to listen so you can help others. You can be there for other people. You can help minister to them where they are. So uh, the very first thing uh, that, that I want you to remember uh, and comfort yourself with is clinging to community. You see, the lepers, okay, you know what they, you know what they did? They made leper communities outside of, outside of cities. You know, they were all unclean, and so they all got together, festering wounds and all, and they hung out. They found community where they are, where they were. And so that's what you need to do. Like, if you're lonely or you feel alone, you feel your struggle, and, like, you have to find community where you're at. Like, if you're here today, if you're attending Restore, like, we have intentionally designed a setting for you to get that community. It's called gospel community. It's one of our core values to be uh, uh, community builders, but also create irresistible community so that anyone who walks around in Yankton or anywhere we're at cannot feel lonely because we're there for them, because we love them. Like, Christians should not struggle with this. Not because it, it's sin, but because we should be creating an environment where it's impossible for someone to feel alone or feel lonely. So we have, to, we have to find community where you are. Write that down. Find community where you are. That's one comfort. you got to find it where you are. The lepers did it. We can do it. If you go to another church, like there's been some back and forth, back and forth, like people jumping over for like a week or two. Like if you go to another church and you serve there, like stay there and find community there. But if you're here, find community here. Like, go to gospel community. Send your kids to Awana. You know, use, use what's available for us. Find community there and cling to it. The second thing there is uh, put your phones down. Like, like some of you, <laughs> including me, we spend so much darn time on our phones that we don't know what's going on around us. Scrolling through Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever it is, watching YouTube, Netflix. Like, we spend so much time on our phones. Like, I bet if some of you took out your phones and showed me your screen time, like, it would be pretty bad, right? Be very bad. But in order to find community and not feel lonely, you got to disconnect from what's breaking you away. Like, and, and if you're trying to fight against that, like, the statistics are against you. The research is against you. Being on technology all the time only drives you away. It doesn't bring you closer. It pushes you away. Like teenagers, I see you. I heard that Snapchat. Oh, man. Oh, ho, ho. Listen to it. Listen to it. That was perfect timing. Get off your phones, okay? Stay, put them down. Put them down. If you got your Bible app open, that's okay, okay? You're okay. I see that Bible app open. I see it. I see that. So, the final thing with that is you've got to let go of your pride. And I want to say this very, very gently. I'm going to say it very gently. Some people, I'm not saying all, but some people refuse to find community because people look a little different than they are, talk a little different than they do, or just worship a little different. And so if you're part of that and you feel lonely, there's some harsh, harsh stuff, but you got to put it down. Set aside the pride. Find community where you are. They don't have to fit X, Y, and Z. Uh, you don't have to go through a checklist and be like, oh, do they fit this? Oh, if they don't, I can't, I can't hang out with them. I can't find community there. Oh, they do this, that's a little off. I can't find community there. Like, put, put down the list. Put down the pride. We're all the same. We're all sinners. If you're, if you're not, like, man, you're lying. <laughs> like, we have to put aside the pride. We have to. We have to cling to community and find community where we're at. Not where we're going, right? We, we can't, like, be here and then find a community out in Cancun, 
right? We, we can't do that. Like, we're here. We're right here. We can't, we got to be here. We got to serve here. Like, join a, join a team. Find community anywhere. Join discipleship. Literally anything where you've got believers around you pouring into you. And I guarantee, if you are open and you are honest with them, you will not feel lonely. Guarantee it. Take it to the bank. Use it as collateral, okay? Take out a second mortgage, even if you don't have a first mortgage. Take it to the bank. The second thing here, very obvious. When you're lonely, just cling to Christ. Seriously, like, like cling, cling to Christ. And, it, and it's, so, it's so simple, yet so profound. Cling to Christ. Why? Why should we? Because he's standing at the door. And he's knocking. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone would open it and let me come in, I will dine with them and them with me. Jesus is clinging to you right now. In this moment, Jesus is clinging to you. He, he doesn't want you to go out there in, in the leper community, right? He doesn't want you to be separated from his people. He wants you to be here with his people, with him. He wants you to know him. Cling to Christ. And some, some people, all they want is the benefits of Jesus, I want the healings, you know, I want the tongues, I want the prophecy, I want all this. But you don't want to know Jesus, and that's what he wants for you. He wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. And not just know about him, but know him intimately. To understand who he is, why he came, and to receive the gift, the fruit of the Spirit, like cling to Christ. Because he's standing at the door and he's knocking. He's waiting for you. He says, here I am. I stand and I knock. No one person can solve this problem. Not a spouse. Uh, not, not a pastor. Right? Not, not a friend. Not even a community. Right? They can't, they can't solve this problem without that one. So this, this isn't about like, I can cling to community or I can cling to Christ. Really the first thing you got to do is you got to cling to Christ. Okay? Because Jesus is the only solution to any one of our problems. We have to cling to Jesus. Because he knows. The leper, he knew. In Mark, what did he say? What did it say? It said, he ran to him, he knelt down, and he worshipped him. And he said, what? I know you can make me clean if you're willing. What does Jesus say? He says, I am willing. I am willing. Be cleansed. The question is, for some of you, are you willing to be cleansed? Are you willing to set aside all the junk and not be lonely or are you hellbound or hellbent on staying in your loneliness? Cling to Christ. And trust me, Jesus knows what you're going through. Hebrews says that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus is God for, for a fact. In the beginning, Genesis 126. God said, let us make man in our image. He didn't do it because God was lonely, because God is perfect community with himself, perfect communion with himself. But Jesus did experience loneliness when he came to this earth. His friend betrayed him. His friends abandoned him at the cross. And he was on, when he was on the cross being crucified, the Father turned his face from Jesus and he poured out the wrath of a billion hells on understand that the father poured out the wrath upon Christ that each and every single one of us okay every one of us deserves but he took it 
because he loves us. So if you feel lonely, be comforted in the fact that Jesus felt lonely in the hardest time of his, his, his life on earth. Being nailed to a cross, being spit at, naked on, 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 this, on this tree. God himself came to earth and was killed by his own creation. And he felt alone. But it, he didn't stay there. He said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back. And so he did. He, he rose himself up from the grave, conquering sin and death. If you feel alone, be comforted that you can find community where you are. You can text GC, like right now. Like if you did, if you text GC, find a gospel community. Sophie's over there. She'd pick up her phone. She'd be like, okay, Daniel, you gotta find these people, gospel communities to go to. And within like two to three business days, (laughs) in two to three business days, you would find yourself a community because we've set it up to do that. Cling to community, cling to Christ. Because Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. And it's so easy. Guys, listen, it's so easy. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. With that being said, uh, I'm going to pray for us and we're going to worship. And if you feel lonely today, If you feel lonely, don't sit in it and don't let it brew, okay? Don't let it stew up. Find somebody. You can even turn to the person next to you. Like if you feel lonely, you can turn to them and say, hey, I'm lonely. Would you be my friend? Would you be my community? Could I join that community? Could I do that? Like it is that easy. And it's going to sound weird, okay? It's going to sound a little goofy because we don't talk like that, but we should. So if you're lonely, do not leave here pursuing loneliness. Pursue community and pursue Christ. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Father, we thank you for the leper uh, who even in disobedience to Christ, going and telling everyone about it, Lord, we have this beautiful, beautiful story of a man running to Jesus to be cleansed. Father, for those of us who are here today and who are lonely, I I pray that they find good, godly community. Father, I pray that they would just put their phones down, that they would put the idols down and follow you, that they would cling to you. Father, I pray that as we sing this last song and as we worship through this last song, Lord, that you would be present here in this place. You would be present with us in our own hearts. We would feel you moving. Father, I pray I pray that, Lord, we finished up peace of mind last week. I pray that that all of those things, the anxiety, the depression, the loneliness, the worry, the, the, uh, the, the negativity, the criticism, the trauma, the burnout, would be sent away in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things knowing that if we ask anything in your name, you will do. Father, we thank you. We love you. Again, in Jesus' name.